I'm Lino Sangren and you're listening to the Cinematography Podcast. The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hello and welcome to episode 35 of the Cinematography Podcast. Woohoo! We've got a great episode today. This is going to be one for the books. Ben, you are Ben Rock. I'm Ben Rock and you are... I'm Ilya Friedman. Neat. And uh, yeah, this is the Cinematography Podcast. And if you didn't, if you were just tuning in, this is your first time ever listening to us. We generally talk to people who have a real opinion about the visuals of a, of a movie. It doesn't have to necessarily be a, uh, a cinematographer, but often it is a cinematographer. And today we have Linus Sangren on who, our who show. You interviewed at uh, Camera Image in uh, Poland, right? I, I did. And uh, I've been looking forward to this one uh, to come out because uh, Linus is working on a huge project right now. Um, Ooh, can you say what it is? Yeah, it's, what it is? it's a new James Bond movie. So, Sweet. Yeah, directed by uh, oh, so, Kerry Fukunawa. So. so second James Bond DP we've had on here. That's right. Sweet. Yeah, and... Uh, we only have like another 30 to go or whatever. You know, you know what? We'll, 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 we'll pick them off one by one. Let's do it. <laughs> so, we should so, start with the Dr. No guy <laughs> if he's still alive. <laughs> And just and just work our way way yeah. up. Well, I think that uh, actually, since there's you know so many of those movies, we probably should pick and choose. So that's true. That's true. But it's so joining R- Roberto Schaefer. It's uh, very exciting to have another another dude who's on a or or woman who's on a James Bond movie. Those movies are awesome and cutting edge, and they always do like the craziest actiony visually stuff. And they're kind of they always at any given t- point in time, those movies kind of lead the world in in that kind of genre. And Linus, of course, has a tremendous his filmography including winning an academy award for la la land little for, stuff yeah exactly stuff like that so without further ado here is linus sangren the cinematography podcast interview linus thank you so much for sitting down with the cinematography podcast and we are at camera image right now which of course is a fantastic festival celebrating the cinematographer here in poland uh, hey, uh, you probably should be promoting some of the stuff that you have out in the theater right now. And you have two movies that are playing right now. You have First mm-hmm. First Man and Nutcracker. What's it like to uh, to have two movies, two big movies out at the same time? Well, it's great to have the opportunity to shoot films that are going to cinemas. I I love it. Uh, obviously, that is that's that's great. And um, well, it's it's kind of hard to promote two films at the same time. Maybe if you want to help uh, advertising them so it's good like now we can talk about both films in the same interview so that's good <laughs> but uh but really what is uh, what what's lovely i think is that it's two completely different movies you know one is for basically for my kids uh it's a disney movie which was something i never had done and and that felt like a great challenge because for me films should be challenges it should be like um, you know i really live off that experience of doing something that i haven't really done before is is fantastic it's and that film was very much designed in, in, with the production designer Guy Diaz built like this huge exteriors on stage indoors, just like in uh, you know Sleepy Hollow or these films, and um, that intrigued me uh, greatly. We decided to shoot on 65 and on 35, but wide shots on 65. So those forests and, uh, you know, I think we had five stages. We built three huge forests on stage. That experience was amazing, you know, to walk around in those sets and have the costumes. And I mean, it's it's there's also CG characters in the film, but in in general, the for the greatest part, even shots I think that you don't think may be real because they're hard to understand. They're real because there's they look large, like huge. Those shots are a lot of them are all in camera, which is uh, fun. So, so that's fun. And then, but then with First Man, it's so completely different because that's a very intimate story, you know, and a realistic story that is um, has the idea of documentary style, cinema verite style uh, imagery. You used a bunch of sixteen uh, millimeter film, I've yeah. heard for for that as well too. Uh, mostly in the beginning, or um... no, it wasn't like a period reason or anything like uh, that. Uh, we felt that a sixteen was. Basically, the um, the soul of the film was a 16 millimeter cinema verite 
documentary shot with eight ton cameras and zooms like that, that that was what we wanted to achieve but practically some scenes you know are hard to shoot on 16 because it just don't hold up the details enough um, you know there's there's ways where when we did tests we saw that 16 was beautiful for the intimacy and the the poetry um, just it has a nostalgia quality to it almost. well it has as well and, and obviously we wanted to to live in the 60s so in general we like the grain for the film we like that style of cinematography they had back then but really more emotionally connecting with the characters in a real way like in a real realism way we thought was 16 millimeter it's much more humble sort of approach and then when, when we did test and shot on 35 uh, we felt it was more like a movie and the movie wasn't supposed to look like a movie it was supposed to look more like a real thing so that's like that that was the thing it was like we actually thought uh, 35 was going to be too clean in certain scenes but then we shot basically at the end i think most footage is 35 um because the whole whole sequence in the middle is 35 but but we shot the 16 millimeter inside all the crafts for example and we shot um, 16 in the beginning of the film but that was because the story is really about this family where everything is you need to be emotionally involved and it's an intimate story and the the sort of grainier 16 millimeter felt like that was what we wanted to apply on on anything that was the most human and the further away we go from the humanity, the more we go IMAX. You know, the more we go 35, and then we go IMAX. The, the, the more separation, the more yeah. cinema. We thought that movie. was like a nice metaphor, you know. Like I, I agree. I, I think it's a, a smart philosophical way to, to approach that. And that actually leads me right into sort of what is my, my stock question. And it's my belief that the best cinematographers, the best DPs, the people who are really masters of their craft are part artist and part plumber. It's impossible to be just 100% artist because if you are, you you don't have any of the technical backing that you need. And then of course you can't be all plumber, totally. otherwise it won't look for it won't look any good at all. So where do you feel like yourself? If you had to like draw a line, you know, do you feel like you're 80, 20, 50, 50? Where was where's your artist plumber uh, mm. line come in? No, I agree with you. I think it's exactly right. And there's more um, professions where you could be like. For example, an architect is usually also uh, half crafts, you know, half, half plumber and half artist. And also, I think, I think I'm in the middle. I think. I mean, I built my own house. For example, I drew it, and my dad was like, "Dude, maybe you should get an architect." Because, like, I don't think if you're not educated architect, you should probably have an architect. And you know, my drawings wasn't. They weren't too bad. You know, of course, the architects have more, you know, precise. Uh, you know prof they're professionals but uh, but my ideas I had been doing research I've been drawing a lot of drawings as a cinematographer actually but um, it's in me like that type of thing and I think I was also interested in uh, in like biology and science I was very curious as a kid on like how do actually whales talk you know like and I was dreaming about being like Shaky of Cousteau and exploring the oceans to research that so in me is as well like that curiosity of you know working with solutions i love crosswords and for me it's like when when i do a film i see it as that too it's like i'm actually exploring the world uh, with the camera and i'm like exploring how to uh, light the set how to come up with the, the sort of technique to do it the right way and and usually as well in as simple way as possible or because that's probably my aesthetic style is that I don't like it to be overly worked, but like to be broad stroked more. So I don't know, but I mean, I love to draw, you know, like I was always drawing when I was a kid. I love, I love art and I, I play some music, you know, it's like, I, I think it's a, it's a combination. It's like 50, 50 probably. Did, did I, did I hear that uh, at one point you were storyboard artist or did some storyboard? Yeah, artist? yeah, totally. All right. I think that that's probably fantastic training though, to help you, figure out how scenes are going to be constructed and go together. Was, yeah. that, was that before you started working behind the camera? Oh, no, 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 no. Um, to me, it's a way to, you know, in the collaboration with the director, it's just like you have different ways you can uh, express yourself. I love to do mood boards. I love to, like, collect photographs or paintings or, um, you know, things to communicate with the director to make sure that we're on the same page so we don't stand there on set because that's like a, a way to create the film is to communicate, obviously. It's like the most important part. And um, storyboards are a great communication tool too, but it could also be 
uh, something that limits you because you start to think about the storyboards too much and you don't have enough uh, freedom. And that's actually interesting when I work with different directors, how different they want to work. And it's really up to them, I think. And and oftentimes, you know, you end up doing uh, simple floor plans and you look from above because we all can imagine what we're seeing through those uh, small uh, floor plans. But um, I did do storyboards to movies because in Sweden, <clears throat> I worked with uh, two directors, um, a, a directing couple, two guys, uh, Mons Molin and Björn Stein, and they, uh, we did a short film together, and then we did a TV movie together, and we did a, a movie together, and then we did another TV series together. And all those times, we sat down, the three of us, and we went through the script, and we took just script, you know, scene one, we read it to each other, and uh, then we said, you know, uh, then we just discussed like, okay, so what's this scene about? Is it like, um, what, what, what is the actual subtext of the scene? And it happened as well because one of the uh, Mons uh, usually is the writer and he, he could even be like, oh, this scene is about nothing. And he, you know, you rip it out. So that's kind of fun, you know, but um, in that situation, in order to align our ideas, uh, we would draw storyboards for each other, like small, uh, Thumbnail sketches. Yeah, or... thumbnail sketches. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I put them together because I think I was the best one in drawing. So mm. uh, I did that usually. And in other films, I, I could do them first. And then we had a professional uh, storyboard artist that finalized it. But um, for one movie, I did actually a, a comic book that we printed for the crew beforehand. So it was a very ambitious <laughs> project. But uh, I love to do that. I did it with another director too. I just drew storyboards. And it's a way to we communicate, we align ourselves, you know. I like it. One of the things I like to do is actually um, put out questions to the community. I like to uh, ask people who follow the podcast and stuff, hey, when we're going to have this person on, what sort of questions uh, would you like to ask? And one of the, the themes that I heard from the comments that I was getting from people who I said, hey, what should we, what should we ask Linus? Um, you've worked with a who's who of sort of young female actresses as they've been exploding into popularity, of course. Uh, and uh, I mean, it, it's uh, Jennifer Lawrence and Emma Stone and Amy Adams and, and you name it and worked with them multiple times. Do you think that do you think that you have a particular approach to flattering light to try to make your leading lady look as uh, as 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 perfect as she can possibly look? Do you have a I, I know you like to keep things simple, but uh, but what is what's your approach when it comes to lighting le your leading lady? Well, maybe my approach is that I don't I think I mean, you always have to be careful with different people's faces and how they look, you know, like and not only women, but I think always have a little bit of a thought of if certain persons are, and this is obviously a subjective thing, like what I feel like looks more uh, pretty maybe, or maybe scary or ugly or whatever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for that character. So so then classic, right, you go long lens or wide angle, it's gonna make a difference how they look. And so, so that all comes into the play in how you judge things with the lenses, I think. But my, I think, I don't know, I think it comes in sort of automatically in your lighting, not because they're women at all, I don't think. I think it's in the scene, in the in the look of the scene, uh, I would choose a lighting that feels appropriate for the scene. And then perhaps because they are integrated in the scene naturally, you know, and not specifically separated. Um, I think what's great with those films that I've done with, with these uh, actresses, is that they have actually delivered great performances that feels authentic and real and and really brilliant performances. Uh, I've, I've been you know fortunate working with these amazing actors, and I don't know. I mean, I think if I would have lit them uh, in a like maybe specific way like they did in the fifties and like had like the perfect studio lighting on them, uh, that would actually have taken away authenticity to the scene. So I think it it may rather be that I have a kind of a if anything, and I'm, I'm totally not try, trying to take credit for their performances or anything, but I think always with actors, it's like with all actors, our role as cinematographers is super important, not only with the lighting, but with our approach, how we talk, how we communicate and how we move the camera around and from what angle we look at them when, when they say things. And I think actually more important than lighting maybe for their performances is where we put the camera and how 
how we watch them and with what type of respect. Because in, in for example, American Hustle, it was a very explosive characteristic driven. I mean, the, 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 the film is like explosive, right? It's like David Russ is like a volcano with his story. It's like, boom, and, and all the characters are alive and... Uh, obviously, that needed to be also photographed in a in a way that was more like up in their faces, and we were like kind of aggressive with how we were curious in how to approach the acting and to see them. The, so you're saying the story the story is is driving the camera placement and the totally. lighting and everything more more so than just saying oh hey I've got this idea oh, on how we're supposed to no know. totally it's yeah. always the story and if that is aligned and if the actors then can act in relation to the story and do their acting properly and not being interrupted by a specific uh, you know lighting where it's like okay now let's shoot the leading lady we have to stop shooting and then like light this scene properly and then it's like get in there okay here you go a photo booth right shoot it and she you look pretty now come on come on act act you know it's not coming up naturally so i guess maybe i give them more room like normal people like mm-hmm. um, i think i i actually treat them just like i treat men male actors um, and and I tried to adapt to what is best for the story and, and in like First Man, for example, that was a lot about being gentle with the approach. You can't just be in their face there because they're talking about so hard things between the two of them that you need to sort of approach them with huge respect as documentary filmmakers in this case because we wanted to have that style, you know. So I think in in all cases you need to like try to visually tell the story visually the same way, the best way for the script and for the story. and. And if that is aligned, uh, perhaps that gives more room for the actors to also come out as better, you know. You've worked with a lot of great directors, Gus Van Sant and um, David O. Russell and Damien Chazelle. Fantastic directors. It, correct me if I'm wrong, as far as like working in, in Hollywood, working in L.A., it's like 2011, 2012. It's a very, very short period of time. And you've worked with like heavy hitters, fantastic, uh, mm-hmm. fantastic people who have... And and you know because I I've never worked with any of them, any of them. Uh, are these are these directors that you would say and I'm sure they're all different but I feel like directors some of them want to focus on actors they want to focus on performance mm-hmm. and they kind of want the cinematographer to figure it out uh, others want to be very involved and have have a you know you know what I'm talking yeah. about they're yeah, they're yeah, they're, they're all well, how if you could make your perfect director if you have, what what style oh. of director do you, do you like to work with do you like to work with someone who's going to be really involved or you want someone who gives you a lot of freedom. What's, what's, what's I mean, your... I, I really, I really enjoy meeting people that are different that, I mean, if, if everything was the same every day, it would be so boring. So the, I've been really fortunate meeting so different type of directors because they're really different, mm-hmm. you know, humans, and they have a very different approaches to how they work. Just like you say, like some are more involved and some are less involved in, uh, in like the actual uh, cinematography work on set and stuff where to place the camera and stuff but um but i think um the perfect director i don't think there's such a thing like perfect director because i I think the whole thing for me at least is the joy of meeting different persons and and actually get challenged or approached differently helps me sort of create new things and the combination of me and gus creates something else than the combination of me and damien and just like another you know like uh Philippe Rousselot and Gus Van Sant would be another combination. So everybody is individuals and we have different uh, approaches. But my my thing is that I try to adapt to the director's vision. And, and obviously, if I feel like I have a better idea, I would say it and we would communicate. It's all communication. But I don't mind if a director want to be very involved in the cinematography. And, and as long as it's communication and, and we, we do the cinematography, it's its own thing. It's being created. Cinematography is being created on a movie always. So you could be more or less uh, collaborating. But I think the collaboration is the best way. And who do who, who's doing what is not as important as what we're making. So you know even if even he, if the director would be like very specific with how the dolly should move or where the camera's pushing in and out and all that as long as i agree with what we agreed on to begin with how the story was going to be told i don't mind like it doesn't matter and maybe i can, that inspires me to come up with a new idea and then that leads to something else that's very much like how uh, I worked with um, David Russell we sit really close together and he would be like emotionally pushing in you know like he he would see that now in this actual moment we need to push in that's going to be a suspenseful 
part of the scene now because of the line you know it's important it was related to the line and it triggers that and i could feel it like wow that was amazing how we push in there it's good that's that's great and i loved i love the push in itself but he was better fitted for telling me when to do it because of the how he hears the story with the lines and i learn right so i I love that, you know, but then I have to adapt to that for other reasons, like with lighting and all that, if, if it's going to change. And that could be frustrating. And there's situations where you're like, oh, no, let's not. And you have to, then that's why it's good to be together. Then you can like right away, if you're improvising, go like, oh, no, let's pull out, let's pull out, let's pan a little left, right? Let's pan left because the light there. And you'll be like, no, right, should be right. Yeah, but look at the light. Okay, okay. And, you know, it's like this. So it's it's very fun to get all that experience. And, and with Gus, for example, he's so... Um, he he really uh, uh, encouraged you rather to not prepare too much and to um, to you know let the actors do a blocking and, and s- study them and see if we can find the shots then and and if if you would suggest a storyboard something with him that would be not good you know like he he wants to he wants the 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 film to live by itself and, spontaneity yeah he wants and, and us to spontaneity and and also us to then observe and and you realize and what i learned from him a lot was that i was thinking about that like imagine we've spent like weeks storyboarding this film and see how we first of all would have come up with the same shots on the on the board but because we didn't we were more uh, receptive for what was going on with the actors in a way that we could find out not only the shots that we would have storyboarded, but new shots that we couldn't come up with. That is just the response exactly to what's going on now in the scene. I, I'm glad you brought up uh, Gus Van Sant. You know, um, Promised Lands is an interesting movie, and uh, I actually don't meet a lot of people who have seen it. I, I saw it. I actually really enjoyed it. And it's, a, it's an anamorphic movie. And uh, I know that you used, uh, or at least I, I had heard that you guys used a 1.3 squeeze for that. And I hear I, now I'm g- going down the, the technical side. Oh, right, exactly. So, What's but, going on? <laughs> but, uh, and and I, don't, I don't mean I don't mean to go too far, but ba- basically, uh, it's it's an it's a sort of a non-standard uh, it's a non-standard squeeze for yeah. for anamorphic, but you can still get the same sort of wide, wide screen aspect ratio and you still get oval bulky and you still get the flares and all that mm. sort of stuff. Was that, that was your first time working together with Gus. How did that all kind of come together? And like, yeah. so, and so you're, you're working together for the first time and you're saying, Hey, I want to do something non-standard. I want to do, I want to do something. No, that, I that, didn't that. say that. Oh, you didn't. You no. didn't. He just gave you the free, no, freedom. No, to no, do, no, no, uh, no. I, I came up with it, but, but I didn't say it because that's the whole point. That's why your blog is not a technical blog Yeah, because it doesn't start with that. It's not like it's not like I like oh I would love I would love to shoot with these new 1.3 times squeeze uh, hawk lenses uh, because they're cool you know it's it starts with that uh, in the discussions with Gus about how to portrait this landscape with these people in an honest way we both I don't remember how we came into it but we talked about like you know like photojournalism like uh, there was this time I I know they, there was this Kodachrome beautiful four by five inch photographs of America like uh, there's there's this beautiful images of normal people workers hardworking people in this beautiful it's like you capture the landscape and capture them in four by five uh, large form format photography uh, was this from like the Works Progress Administration exactly yeah 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 uh, and those are beautiful and and they're especially beautiful to actually watch like a little faded like almost like they're printed on a paper and there the blacks goes a little grayer and I mean this is only like aesthetically that felt like an inspiration that was interesting to approach so so we were like oh should we shoot it in 65 that would be cool like shoot it in a large the largest format we can at IMAX can, can, you can't shoot uh, you know uh, so much dialogue with but um, 65 millimeter cameras and they were just shooting PT Anderson was shooting the the master oh the master of course yeah, yeah the master uh, shooting 65 right so uh, Gus called Paul Thomas Anderson to ask about like the experience of shooting with it but in an aesthetic way in the storytelling way that felt like an appropriate format in this case because that was our inspiration now that was very expensive for our little budget and we felt that we need to compromise on this somehow and what is the compromise well then i pulled out from my back of my head that uh, that vantage uh, in germany had made these hawk lenses that was 1.3 squeeze and i was like i mean they were made for 4 by 3 go 178 or for 178 goes uh, 235 so I thought that the largest format you could get out of a 35mm camera is silent, right? It's a silent mode, 
is the full ap aperture and if but we didn't want to have a four by three looking image so uh, we were thinking like what if we do 185 then and then perhaps even for video release it's 178 and we just use utilize the entire negative as much as we can but in that shape so with the um, doing the 1.3 squeeze uh, we could get then a 178 image that's more humble than 240 because we felt 240 is too movie-ish we want to be stay like and also photography is usually in like uh, you know that format more so that was the reason and then when we started testing the cameras and we we saw the bokeh and we we loved the bokeh it wasn't really what is in those images but then that became another texture and the combination of them you know, you always have to be open and a little loose and flexible, but work with your feelings, I think. In all these decisions, it's about feelings. And and we ended up pull processing because in the testing, we felt that was um, that, that re reminded us of those printed versions of the Kodachrome. A, a little more faded and a little less contrast, a little yeah. bit, uh, yeah, a little bit more noise, a little grain. Yeah. So yeah, no, uh, good stuff. So, so Linus, thank you very much for sitting down with us. I know we're just about out of time, but thank you so much for being on thank the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was fun. And that was Lena Sangren. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I can't wait to have you on again. Hey, Ben, it is time to pay the bills. I love paying bills. Uh, bill paying today is courtesy of Airy. We got to give him a, a proper shout out because 2019 every year, it seems like Airy makes headlines that, you know, Academy Award Oscar winning movies shot on Airy cameras this year. 2019 was no exception. In fact, basically all the really big movies, it seems like used Airy cameras. And what, talking, what are some of the movies? Okay. Like a star is born a star is born used uh, shot by Maddie Lee Batik. Maddie Lee Batik is wonderful on the show. Uh, yeah. Airy Alexa mini and then plus uh, anamorphic lenses from a bunch of different people. Uh, but uh, yeah, Ari Alexa Mini was the camera behind that. Uh, also, uh, Black Panther, Black Panther um, shot, shot by Rachel Morrison. That's right. Also on the show, uh, Ari Alexa XT Plus was uh, was used for that, uh, which is uh, you know, one of their fantastic film cameras. Um, uh, Black Klansman used a lot of different cameras, but the Aricam LT uh, film 35 millimeter film camera also used uh, Bohemian Rhapsody uh, shot Sh by <laughs> Newton Thomas Single. <laughs> Newton Thomas Single also on the show, which you can go back and listen to. Lots of Airy cameras, Airy Alexa 65, uh, Airy Alexa SXT, Aeroflex uh, 35 BL, all used on that show. Uh, plus also the special uh, Airy Prime DNA series lenses, which were made for the 65, super cool. Uh, Cold War, which uh, which was um, Airy Alexa XT. And then uh, the favorite, also uh, Robbie Ryan on the show. Uh, he used a, a, a suite of Airy cameras, including the Airy Cam LT and ST. And one super fish eye lens. <laughs> uh, Green Book. Uh, Aria Alexa Mini, again, uh, as, a, as a hero camera, a main camera for that. Um, uh, Never Look Away was another was another movie, um, which was a uh, Aria Alexa XT. Roma, of course, the Aria Alexa 65. Vice, Aria Cam LT, Aria Cam ST, Aria Flex uh, 235, 435. Uh, yeah, it's it was a huge, huge 2019 for Aerie. So uh, big congratulations to them. And of course, uh, all the wonderful movies that were made with those cameras. I can't wait to see what they come out with next. I mean, I guess they just came out with it because NAB was like a month ago. But yeah, still we'll be we'll be talking about it. But yeah, it's uh, it was it was a big year. So uh, so Ben, it's uh, short end time. So as we record this, and it probably won't come out for a few weeks, but as we record this, the Game of Thrones episode, uh, the Battle of Winterfell, was you know one of the most watched things on on television. The same night, on the same network, HBO, Barry, uh, which is the uh, kind of dark comic show that was uh, co-created Bill by, Hader by Bill Hader, uh, had an episode called Ronnie slash Lily, Ronnie Lily, and this episode. <laughs> hit me way more I mean the Battle of Winterfell is you know an amazing one of the most expensive and longest battle scenes ever filmed Ronnie Lilly is basically one nonstop action scene that is equal parts like totally brutal and hilariously funny and it was directed by Bill Hader oh yeah and shot by a woman named Paula Hudaboro I hope I'm pronouncing that name correctly and it does not make a single misstep and it is full of crazy action and it is like it, it's a perfect piece of art if you've 
never seen an episode of Barry, you need to know almost nothing going into this episode. You could just jump right into it, and you'd be able to follow the story. All you have to know is that Bill Hader's character is is a uh, a hitman. That's all you need to really know. And uh, it's uh, the episode is bananas and just perfectly made and i hope everybody on earth goes and sees it uh i i hope it wins all the emmys it, it blew my mind the, the show's great it's got uh henry winkler uh as like um a, a actor slash drama instructor who steals in my opinion almost every scene he's in he's great uh anthony kerrigan who plays hank the mob boss from from where is it lithuania the uh, like chechnya chechnya he's a, he's supposed to be a chechen uh mobster that guy's great he is he's also he's made a a, a a habit of scene stealing on the on that show and it's like and when i say stealing i mean it's just like holy crap i, I mean the writing is so good for them and some well, quite often bill Hader plays a straight man to these all these other characters and in general and uh you can back me up on this if something is about the entertainment business or hollywood i immediately despise it. it's your kryptonite yeah you I, won't watch it i can't stand it and so i kind of begrudgingly started watching barry in season one because i think bill Hader's pretty awesome and he's more than pretty awesome he's freaking great well <laughs> he's, yes he's, especially on this show well that's the thing i i didn't know what to expect because i knew i knew his work on saturday night live but it's about uh, a hitman who who accidentally stumbles into an acting class and learns that he has a huge love of of acting and so it's kind of like a mild satire of acting classes in la and i've been it's so on point though i've been around a lot but but honestly even given my uh outrageous antipathy for stories that take place in the in and around the business and also stories that take place around business wannabes the show business wannabes i find those often to be lazy this is head and shoulders above that but and, and i love the show but this episode ronnie lily which is the fifth episode of season two uh like is a it's it's like a class in how to do dark comedy and how to do action and ha- i mean like everything every moment of it is brilliant i went back and watched it again after i watched it i i, I can't get enough of this episode alec berg uh i, I love silicon valley i i i, I love i love this guy's work and um it's i will say that What's great about Barry is it it feels like something that Alec Berg would do, but it does not feel like an exact copy of like Silicon Valley or something else not on at all, HBO. Yeah. It is it is its own show with its its very own sort of like dark off kilter tone, and uh, they it's tight. Every yeah, it's a it's like a thirty minute show, but it Correct. is it is tight. It is very very tight. There's a and lot no episode has been tighter in a, in two seasons that were both really awesome. No no episode has been like as perfect most shows will never have an episode as perfect as this one episode that Bill Hader directed and uh, now I want now I want to see him I, I sort of feel like he's about to do what Jordan Peele did which is to take is to go from being like funny funny guy into suddenly being like very taken very seriously filmmaker uh, I think you're right I think we're about to see a lot more of Bill Hader so not a uh, bad thing not not at all all right so my short end this week is something technology related. So uh, I know I don't do this a lot, but when uh, when there's something is really, really special uh, that is worth talking about that's tech, I, I do want to try to bring it into the show. And there is a company out of China called Nanlite. Uh, Nanlite is the, is the new U.S. branding that they've come up with. They also have a, a sister sort of line of products called LedGo that have been around for a while, and they're getting revamped with some better stuff. But the Nanlite essentially is a teeny tiny uh, a teeny tiny par it's a really really bright led light that is about the size of like two decks of cards stacked on top of each other and it's ridiculously bright it also costs like 300 bucks so it's a little chinese light that is extremely high quality extremely bright and 300 bucks we're actually working on some special kits through hot red cameras we're going to bundle it in but if you can imagine having a interview light kit like uh the older style airy tungsten kits where you'd have like you know three four oh, five i, well. oh I think i figured you would everyone in who the, ever worked in production in the big case, rolling gray case that's exactly oh, right so, how many how many of my car seats have i destroyed by loading those into my back seat I, I once saw a guy driving around in a in a bmw convertible in los angeles a little two-seater with the airy light kit on the passenger seat mm-hmm. and it was sticking up like two feet above his windshield and he had his arm around that light kit as he was driving and i was like that's a perfect like you know metaphor of la right there i wish and i had that a man camera. was vilmos sigmund <laughs> 
<laughs> it was not. It was definitely not Vilma Zygmunt. But uh, anyway, my, my point here, bringing up the uh, the old school sort of like ubiquitous kit is I want to make a new one of those with these little lights, because the truth is, is that uh, these could all fit in a briefcase. This could fit in some tiny little thing and uh, you can plug it into house power. It doesn't take it's it's 60 watts, which if you think about that, that's like a household bulb. Man, so I need to get one of these. Like I, I honestly, I have like an interview kit from the dawn of time and it's still incandescent and I hate it. I never use it. Yeah, I, I'm going to make a new modern. I don't know what I'm going to call it. I don't know what it's going to be, but I'm going to put together a, a little kit. And it's going to be in a cool case and maybe it'll have stands separately or in the same thing, but uh, it'll be focused and built around this light. And this light is absolutely going to be revolutionary for the people who need bright lights. Oh, it can be powered by batteries. It can be powered by two like little uh, DV style batteries, which oh, is, nice. and it's incredible. It is oh, well, uh, like, is it uh, like, what's the color temperature situation and all it's that? A, it's daylight color, but daylight is very easy to turn into tungsten with a little piece of gel. It doesn't t knock too much away and you won't miss it anyway. Cause this thing is like, uh, 85% as bright as some other popular lights out there at a fraction of the cost. Nice. So 85% is bright and one third the cost. So uh, I think this is uh, sort of a dawning of a new era for uh, LED lighting. And there's more and more stuff that's going to be coming out there. But if you go to hotrodcameras.com and look up the Nanlite Forza 60, F-O-R-Z-A 60 is what they call it. It's incredible, and I will be posting. Uh, we actually have a, a, a secret group now on uh, on Facebook called the Hot Red Cameras New Technology Group. It's not a secret anymore. Yeah, well, it's not that secret. It's we, you know, what it is like it's 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 a private group, so maybe it's not totally secret. But anyone who's listening to the podcast who wants who's interested in tech who uh, wants to talk about or is interested in this light specifically, I'm going to be posting some videos there and some photos and some other stuff inside the Facebook Hot Rod Cameras Technology Group, uh, New Technology Group, and you are all welcome to join. Sweet. I'll have to join that. Hey, so so Ben, that's the end of the show. Uh, where can people find you? Please find me at benrockonline.com. You can see my work there. I probably need to update it, but I got a bunch of stuff there. I'm on Twitter at Neptune Salad and all the other places. If you uh, look me up on uh, Instagram or Facebook, you can find me. Say hi. Some people from the po from uh, podcast listeners have been reaching out to me to say hi, and it's very nice. Yeah, and follow the podcast on uh, Instagram. Follow the podcast on Twitter. We are uh, at the Cinepod on Instagram, and uh, sh at Short Ends with a Z. I'm sorry we ever chose that, but oh, that's what man. we've got for for Twitter. And of course, like our Facebook page. Give us reviews. Send us send us emails if you don't like the show. If you if there's stuff you want to hear more of or people you'd like to have us get on the show, we really do go after people and I think we're going to get more directors now that we've had uh, Lige on in our last episode. We got some more people sort of in the pipeline and Ben I'm going to be looking at you to do some more of these director interviews. Well now that my boy is a year old I can probably squeeze off a little bit more time and have any brain space to do interviews. I, I was wondering whether or not we were going to be able to make it through an episode without you mentioning your, your prodigy. Yeah he's awesome. He's uh, yeah he's uh, already he's got his own uh, area. Uh, so. <laughs> he's going to be starting a podcast too. He's got his own podcast. Actually there's a great uh, a podcast hosted by a five-year-old kid called the show about science is this true it's a real podcast oh my and, God. It's, and it's this five-year-old kid who interviews like real science people and it's brilliant mm -hmm. everybody should it's 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 such a fun podcast hey let's thank our crew without whom we would not be able to do this we got to thank our producer alana Co cody thank you so much alana thank you alana you're the best and uh, let's thank our editorial staff of Abby Corbett and Ben Katz. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you for making us not sound like morons. And of course, Kay Zalatrachki. It was great to see you in uh, in Vegas, and I hope that we get to hang out again soon, Kay's. Uh, and uh, Kay's thank you for letting us use your music. Multi hyphenate. Yeah, he so he composed every scrap of music, and he's also helping me right now do a visual effects shot, a very complicated visual effects <laughs> shot for. Uh, the upcoming second season of 20 seconds to live is there anything that guy can't do seriously case is uh an amazing uh he's good at uh color grading he's a visual effects artist mm -hmm. he's a director and he's a composer and he can also do sound design yeah he's got like a music video coming here's out. here's the thing yeah. about case he doesn't need you <laughs> that's you true you need him you do. that's very true if you if you ever want to hire someone who feels like they, they don't need you no no that's, no, no, not, that's not it at all. he's awesome i actually saw the music video that he did and he told me how he made it and, and uh it's an amazing story and i think he did it like by himself or close to it yeah i mean he had a dp but like he basically shot it on his back porch on a green screen and it is some high-tech sci-fi stuff and uh, he did like all the CGI himself. I, I can't wait to see it. It's pretty amazing. All right. Until next time. Thanks so much. For, and uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. We, we really appreciate it and want and want to keep doing more of this stuff. 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the great anticlimactic ending there, Ben. Sorry. I appreciate it. That's what it. I okay. do. All and right. and we're out. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.